Mish Khan Academy Digital Sessions. We're joined this afternoon by Hashi Mohammed. Hashi's a barrister, author, broadcaster, and a friend of the firm. And on first impressions, it's not immediately obvious what a remarkable case Hashi represents. In certain respects, he's precisely what you'd expect from a leading planning barrister. Fiercely intelligent, like that. Eloquent, a storyteller, and brimming with self-confidence. However, look a little closer, and he should not be here. He's a statistical outlier, and sadly, an anomaly. It's a fact that only 3.3% of working class and underprivileged children will end up in professions like law, finance or medicine. This figure will be immeasurably smaller for those that entered the country as a child refugee, aged nine, speaking only basic English, attended some of London's lowest performing schools, but ultimately graduated with a master's degree from Oxford. Hashi is quoted in saying that the demographic that listens to Radio 4 documentaries about inequality are the least likely to be affected by it. It's likely that he'd say the same thing about a Mishcon digital session. However, Hashi, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much, Tom. I really appreciate that. Um, that's probably one of the best introductions I have ever had. That is, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. You better, you better send me a copy of that, because I'm going <laughs> to hand that over to everyone else. So it's a theme running through your story that, um, that an individual's path is really guided uh, well before their birth. And you start your book talking about your grandfather, also a hashi, rather evocatively, uh, 377 kilometres outside of Mogadishu. Yes. Uh, my my grandfather was a you know a goat herder working in the wilderness of uh, Somalia some close to you know a hundred years ago now, and it, it's a mark of the journey that we have had in our lives that I find myself now in central London, very very far away from the world that he was familiar with, and crucially in a very short space of time. Mm. And that journey has been a, um, quite a difficult one and in many ways also a lucky one. Mm. Um, my grandfather being born in the wilderness of, of, of the sort of rural uh, Somalia as it was then, uh, Italian uh, Somaliland, an Italian colony, to then my father marrying and settling in Nairobi, Kenya, he then passes away in a car crash in Kenya when I was only nine years old. In the early 1990s, when sort of war broke out in, um, in that part of the world, which then led to us coming to this country in the early 1990s without our mum, having just helped to bury my father. My mother had given birth to 12 children. We're all scattered around the world. Some of my siblings end up in America, some end up in Canada, we end up here. And, and you know, when, when people hear that, it, it's, it's often obviously a, an incredibly shocking start to life. And any child who's nine years old sort of starting from scratch without your parents is difficult for any nine-year-old. But actually, it's, it's really important, and I say this a lot, uh, when I when I speak about my 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 story, and um, it's that that kind of starting point is remarkably unremarkable for people mm. like me, because when you look at the vast majority of the Somali community in this country, in Europe, and elsewhere who fled war in the early 1990s, the overwhelming majority of them have similarly harrowing stories, mm. similar tragedies, perhaps even worse than what I have experienced in some cases. But I suppose what makes my story different, which I'm sure we'll get into, is, is what then happened afterwards. I've got, I've got one quote for you here from the book. I'm not going to read from it. Just one quote? Just the one. So you say, we might see ourselves as a brother, a fiance, an uncle, a Liverpool fan, a bookworm, a graduate, a petrol head, a scouser, a Virgo, a millennial. The list is potentially endless. But over all of these infinite variations loom two great categories that shape our identities and our futures like no other in modern Britain, race and class. Tell me what you mean by class. Yeah, so, so it's a, that part of the, your reading is from uh, the chapter uh, on identity mm. and how we see one another. And what's also particularly noteworthy about that chapter and that section that I've written about identity and I say what looms large is about race and class is we talk about race and class in a significant way today in the post sort of George Floyd and everything that happened in the past year. 
But I wrote those words almost five years ago whilst I was writing this book and I was talking about it in a way that perhaps we are more accustomed to talking about today, but it's not necessarily in the way that people understand it to mean today. So for example, when I talk about race and class looming large, what I argue for is that we need to understand what kind of combinations of relationships we're building when it comes to becoming a more equal society. Right. So for example, I don't have much in common, really, with a black Etonian who went to Eton and his family could afford for him to go to Eton and then he becomes a professional. Just because we're both black, we have actually really very little in common. Mm -hmm. I have more in common with my sort of white working class neighbors whose parents might have been bus drivers and plasterers with the Afghan refugee who came who didn't speak a word of English in my neighborhood because they are the ones with whom I'm going to the same crap local schools, facing the same problems in our streets, yeah. being harassed by you know police in the streets in the way that we were when we were young and naive and, and, and quite stupid. And so one of the things I talk about there is I say, look, race is important, don't get me wrong. A black guy with a Muslim name growing up in the sort of post 9-11 world, trust me, it wasn't easy. But, but equally, there's a lot more to how we identify these, these connections. And that's what I think I was trying to get at yeah. in the book or in that, in that chapter. So how do you feel that the, the, the conversations moved on then? In it's that post it's interesting Ford, yeah. because I think the conversation has moved on to a place that I personally don't think is healthy in that, um, and I've been attacked for this in the newspapers for sort of looking at things this way, but I feel like whilst race and class, gender, disability, and all these other aspects do play a significant role as to whether or not you will become successful in this country or whether or not you will go far in this country or whether you will have the right opportunities, I do feel though that we're in a place now where we're all engaged in what I call the grievance Olympics. In the, in the if you are um, uh, you know, a, a black woman who's disabled and gay, then you tick all the boxes that somebody wants to be with you and know you and help you and so on. Yeah. And somehow if you're you know, somebody who is uh, not any of those things, somehow you're less worthy of help and less worthy of attention. I just feel like we're losing the focus and attention of what it means to be a more equal society. What it means to be a more equal society, in my judgment, is to attack the kind of things that mean that, for example, uh, black women are disproportionately almost four times more likely to, ha to die at ch in childbirth because of the way the NHS treats them than any other community. Or that if you are a kid on free school meals, no matter what race you belong to, you are much more likely to sort of be left behind by the time you're 10, 12. Mm -hmm. And I could give you a number of those statistics, but yeah. they're not as simple or simplistic as just saying, you know, black, white, Muslim, Jewish, whatever it is. It's far more complicated. But I feel like the conversations that we're having in the public space today are just simplified in a way that is much more headline grabbing, attention seeking, and ultimately actually damaging to the way we relate to one another as a society. So how should we be talking about it? Well, we just need to be more nuanced about it and more intelligent. Nuance doesn't sell papers though, unfortunately. No, and nuance doesn't sell papers, you're absolutely right. And intelligence even less so. So uh, um, it's a question of just asking yourself, if you're an organization, I don't know, like, uh, uh, like Mishkon Durea, for example, and you're trying to become a more diverse workforce, it's too simplistic to just be like, we need to recruit more black people. Mm -hmm. We need to recruit more gay people. We need to recruit more women. No, you need to ask yourself, what is it about our recruitment processes and the way that we work, the culture that we have within, how people see us, that means that a, a small kid growing up in Tyneside or Teesside or, or in the Northwest or in the Northeast or in Tower Hamlets does not think actually that's the place I want to be. The reason why I call the book People Like Us is yeah. that term means different things to different people, right? People like us don't go there or darling, we don't mix with people like them, you know? And it can be meaning 
different things to different people. And so for me, I just think we need to have those more serious conversations because actually the kind of conversations we're having now are neither helpful, but more and more importantly, are gonna be more damaging in the future in my judgment. And how do you think we open those channels up? Is that something which rests with firms like Michigan or the employers or whoever that might be, or is it for the individuals to find a path? It's a, it's a bit of both. I don't think it rests with the government, certainly, because we don't have a, a serious government for serious times, but that's my view. Not, not, not uh, other, other political views are available. <laughs> um, I do think a huge amount rests with the individual. I often say to people, um, you know, if you think that the bar, a place that's been going on for almost a thousand years, yeah. is gonna change its ways overnight to accommodate you, then I'm afraid you are as delusional as you will be waiting a long, long time. That's something that really comes through in your book, actually, and in a lot of the other you know, articles, etc., that you've written. You are very much a realist, however much you've got great ideals about what you want and you think we should strive for better, you are firmly anchored in reality. I'm very much anchored in reality because I always say to people, you have to deal with the world as it is yep. rather than as you would like to find it. And the way the world as it is is that you are disproportionately more likely to have your CV go straight in the bin if your name is Mohammed than if it's Smith. F fact. Mm. So a lot of people make decisions, personal decisions. I was talking to a, a law firm a couple of weeks ago and a lady put up her hand up and she said, oh, my name's Jessica and I wanted to ask you this question. I was born in China and I, I grew up in Hong Kong and here I am sitting in this amazing law firm. I was like, oh, okay, can I just ask a personal question? I said, um, do you also have a Chinese name? Is Jessica actually your real Jessica? Yeah. She's like, oh yeah, I have a Chinese name, but I'd never put that on a CV. Why do you think she's made that decision? Because somehow, some point in her life, she realized that she was, she was, she was hampered. Now that's a personal choice, mm. but that is somebody who's dealing with the world as it is, yeah. rather than as, as they would like them. Now I'm not suggesting to everyone that they need to change their name or change how they speak or how they work to get on. But what I will say to everyone is, that's the world that, as you find it. Yeah. If you decide to then plow on and ignore those facts, that's a matter for you. Yeah. But there's one other thing that I'd add to that. It's the kind of thing that often people say, be yourself, you're gonna be just fine. That is one of the most poisonous unhelpful, stupid pieces of advice anyone can give anyone who's trying to make it in, 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 this, in this current world. And that's because it's meaningless. The reality is that we are shifting and changing the way we are depending on who you're talking to, where you are. You, Tom, don't talk to your spouse the way that you talk to I'm your much, parents. I'm much kinder to her than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, uh, for your own safety. <laughs> and, and, and you don't talk to your boss the way you might talk to a child. We are constantly changing as human yeah. beings. And that, for me, is the kind of lack of understanding. Because the reality is that if you try and be yourself and not understand about the world that you're dealing with, What's going to happen is you're going to get knocked back all the time. And what's the conclusion that that young person's going to reach? The conclusion that young person is going to reach is that nobody wants, respects, or has a place for me as I am. You talk about the idea of educational apartheid in the UK. Obviously, there is a huge difference in the, the quality and the type of education that, that we receive in this country. So. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the often cited uh, statistic is the fact that 7% of the Britain, British population go to private schools, fee-paying schools, and they dominate 93 to 94% of the top professions. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more to attending those kind of institutions than just what you're taught Absolutely. in the lessons. There's everything. There's the... There's the ability to just pick up the language, there's the cultural and social capital, there is that inculcation of believing that you are destined for big things, that you're gonna do well, that you don't have to worry about um, uh, 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 what your kind of future will look like. It's self-selecting because a lot of these kids either pass exams or the parents can afford to, to, to pay for their fees, they end up in a you know, in an environment where, you know, even, even when you think about, 
if you're in Oxford or Cambridge and you have a supervisor who is supervising you and a, and a co-supervisee as, as pupils and teaching you in that Oxbridge College, you come to the bar as a barrister where I am now and you're a pupil who has a supervisor and there's usually two of you being supervised. It's like, it's almost like perfectly designed to mirror wherever it is that you've come from. And it fits and it makes sense. And so this idea that somehow we're in this elite profession where if only you were willing to work hard enough, if only you were wanted it badly enough, yeah. you would succeed. It's, it's nonsense. Yes, if you're not, if you don't have the quality and if you're not talented enough and you're not willing to be hardworking, it's gonna be, you know, not really possible. Mm. But this notion that it's just simply about hard work and determination, and everyone else who doesn't do it is just being lazy, that's the bit that I find particularly galling. When was the moment when you thought that you might become a barrister, or when did that become an option? I remember when we were homeless, and I used to go to the homeless um, place called Mahatma Gandhi House, it used to be called in Wembley, and I remember, I remember going there with my mum, who could barely communicate in English, trying to explain we had rats and, and all sorts of problems where we were living and we were trying to get moved on to, from this hostel to a proper house. And I remember being quite short and, you know, and seeing my mum trying to communicate to this woman and it was like a raised platform and the woman was there and you'd be waiting the whole day trying to get your ticket. And then when your ticket gets called, you go up to the desk and you're trying, to, and my mum's just literally just trying to explain there are rats, there are this, we need help. We're having breathing problems because of the, the walls. And I remember the woman, I still have this woman's face in my head. I remember her looking at my mum like she was the scum of the earth and just going, go sit back down, go sit down. Somebody will come and get you, go sit down, like waved her away like that. And I remember thinking, I don't ever want to experience that. Yeah. I don't ever want to have anything like that done to me. Now, did I think I was going to be a lawyer, an author, a, you know, a broadcaster, barrister, whatever? Like, no. But what I did know is I wanted to understand my rights. And then when I was in that year, I was living sort of homeless and, and, and trying to think about whether I wanted to go to university. It was a natural progression to then start doing law. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing a law and French degree. I wanted to learn another language. And it was only really when I was in my third year of law that I thought, okay, this is it. I want to go down the barrister route. But it was only like, you know, in my mid-twenties that that really dawned on me. And then 26, 27 is when I got my pupillage. All it remains to say is, Hashi, thank you ever so much. And if everyone could thank him in the usual way. Thank you very much. The Mishkan Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.